All right, everybody, welcome back to Contemporary American Literature. This week we will be looking at the moment of the end of the 20th and into the 21st century of American literature with uh, mostly reference to fiction this week with some nonfiction and the movement called the New Sincerity, a sort of unofficial movement, but one that's been, this is not a term I'm making up. In other words, uh, it's, it's unofficial, but it's, you know, like many of the terms we've looked at, the writers themselves tended not to claim it for themselves, but uh, scholars have applied it, journalists have applied it. It's been a term that's been used to describe much of the literature and other uh, artworks of this period from film to music. Um, so the new sincerity will be today's topic and we're going to look at a piece of nonfiction by David Foster Wallace and then three short stories by George Saunders, Jhumpa Lahiri, and Juno Diaz. Um, and really I think Wallace and Saunders belong in a in a pretty strong way to the new sincerity. Lahiri and Diaz I think it's not so much that they belong to this movement, but that their work, they're writers of the same generation, and their work is sort of in this atmosphere of what I think of as a reaction against postmodernism, uh, against some forms of postmodernism, and an attempt to write a post-postmodern, or in some cases an anti-postmodern literature. And <clears throat> as I always do, I try to put some of these movements in broader historical, social, political and cultural context. So the illustration on my slide is an event from 1989, which is the fall of the Berlin Wall in Germany, which signal, uh, signaled the end of the division between East and West Berlin, between East and West Germany, which looked forward to the collapse of the Soviet Union two years later in 1991, which in effect ends the Cold War. And I think this end of the Cold War uh, along with the fact that we're also going to see a generational shift in the writers we're looking at is, I think, an important fact and a bit of background to the ethos of the new sincerity, the kind of attitudes, preferences, moral values, and aesthetic priorities of the writers of the new sincerity. I think it could, in a sense, only have happened in this atmosphere of the end of the Cold War. Because the end of the Cold War was not just the, the end of the Cold War, it was also interpreted as something uh, much more far-reaching. And that's what I want to look at next. So throughout the course, I have try to define some of the eras that we've looked at. We talked about the 50s, the 60s, uh, sort of the long 60s, and then sort of the long 80s, as I was joking, because I don't think I ever <laughs> tried to characterize the 1970s. Um, and we have a similar thing here, where uh, it's not really one decade I want to talk about. It's more of a broader era. And I've given it these dates, 1989 to 2008. And I, I sort of made, I, I did sort of make that up. But, uh, but I think these dates are meaningful. So 1989 is the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I think that is the moment where it's clear that the Cold War uh, that has hung over and defined so much of the materials of this course, particularly some of the materials in the, the earlier parts in the 1950s and then the later parts in the 80s when there was peak anxiety about nuclear war, uh, the Cold War defined a great deal of American literature uh, of the post-World War II to the present period. So that really starts to come to an end in 1989. And then I, I think 2008 I use as the terminal date for what I think of as a period, a kind of generational era, 1989 to 2008, um, because that's the, uh, the year of the financial crisis, the big financial crisis of the early 21st century. And I think with that, uh, something, something new that we're still living through and we're still working through and we're still coming to terms with uh, begins. So the period from 1989 to 2008 is what I think of as, uh, as what I'm calling the ends of history and the end, uh, the end of history and the end of irony. And both of these things were proclaimed at different points in this period, particularly the end of history. This is a phrase uh, a very misunderstood phrase that has uh, been in use since 1989 uh, in American and global politics to characterize the end of the Cold War. So what is the idea of the end of history? How could the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, the rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union, how could this produce something as dramatic as an end to history? Well, the answer is this. So 
with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, some thinkers, particularly this philosopher or political scientist named Francis Fukuyama, who was then working in the State Department in the uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush administration, but I think by training was a political philosopher, he looks around the world in the late 1980s and he can clearly see uh, even before the Soviet Union collapses, that in both the Soviet Union and in China, these two communist world powers, there are uh, changes uh, occurring. Even before the Soviet Union collapsed, it began to reform. And China was in a period of reform in the 1980s. And that reform generally um, took the form of introducing more free market principles into their economics because the idea well it's not the idea of communism but the way communism developed in the soviet union and china was the state management of the economy uh you know the state you know nationalizing industries uh, setting wages and prices etc and so what happens in the 80s in both countries in China and Russia is you have leaders who begin to reform the system to bring it more into line with market principles. And then with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, you have the introduction, the more formal introduction of democratic uh, political structures. So Fukuyama, this philosopher, uh, is looking around and he says that what's happening is that the great rival to liberal democracy and capitalism in the second half of the 20th century is being defeated. And in the what happened in the first half of the 20th century, well, another great rival, which was fascism, was defeated. And he says, so by the end of the 20th century, you have communism and fascism being defeated and being reformed and made over into liberal democratic uh, capitalist countries, just as the fascist countries of Germany and Japan were defeated and made over into liberal democratic capitalist societies. So Fukuyama predicts Russia and China will, however slowly, go the same way. And he says that what this means is that the ideological development of humankind may be at an end, that the principles of the American Revolution have won and they no longer face serious rivals. He says there are rivals. He says there are, you know, there are nationalist governments, there are religiously fundamentalist forces, but he says they're not really, he says they're just sort of throwbacks to earlier ways of thinking, and they'll be sort of easily dispatched. And so he says, I'll read a quote from his famous essay, The End of History, uh, that was published in the magazine Foreign Affairs in 1989. He says, what we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. We might summarize that the content, we might summarize the content of the universal homogenous state, this liberal democratic state that will soon be the only state left in the world, as liberal democracy in the political sphere, combined with easy access to VCRs and stereos and the economic. So liberal democracy, um, representative government with free elections and um, transparent and equitable legal structures in the political realm, and then in the economic realm, cheap access to consumer goods. He says this is the final form of government. And he didn't just come up with this idea. If you read his essay, he's drawing on a European philosopher from the 19th century named Hegel, H-E-G-E-L. And Hegel actually pronounced the end of history to have occurred in 1806. And Fukuyama actually agrees with that, because what happens in 1806 is Napoleon wins a victory over some of the uh, German states that Hegel was writing in. And Napoleon was seen by Hegel to be the bearer of this ideology of democratic, enlightened government. And so Hegel says that, you know, this this essentially is the end of history. The principles of the French and the American revolutions have triumphed. And there's sort of nothing left to do but to extend these principles. 
So that's what politics becomes after 1989. It's no longer a matter of grand ideological struggles between Marxists and liberals and fascists, uh, people who are willing to die for these grand, uh, you know, causes, these idealist uh, beliefs. All of that sort of falls away. Everyone can agree on what the correct form of government is. And all that's left to do is to just extend that by wiping out any backward opposition there might be, secure human rights and democracy and the consumer society for everyone in the world. So that's what's left to do, the protection uh, of human rights, the spreading of the liberal democratic ideology of human rights throughout the world. That is what's left to do politically. The kinds of ideological you know, contests we were seeing in the early earlier parts of the course where you had some uh, some fairly radical writers, uh, that kind of falls away and you have this much more modest goal of politics, though the, the goal of politics is only modest because this very immodest claim has been made that we, the United States, have won the uh, 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 an almost cosmic war for ideological supremacy and all we need to do is to uh, to tinker around the edges and and make sure that 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 still works so that's the idea of the end of history I go on about this because you still hear this idea of the end of history and people mocked it at the time without really understanding what he was saying or having any familiarity with the philosophical sources he was drawing on as if he were saying that nothing would happen or, um, you know, and people were always saying, oh, this has been disproved by any time there's like a war. And that's not his point. His point was a more abstract one that there, there it, and I, I actually think his point at least up until the the last maybe decade, was fairly persuasive that there didn't seem to be a global universalist challenger to liberal democracy, that for a while there, it was unchallenged as the ideal of government. And so that's the end of history. What's the end of irony? Well, the end of irony was proclaimed after the attacks of September 11th, 2001, a terrorist attack in New York and Washington um, that uh, plunged America into two wars in the course of the, the next few years um, and into a much different tone than the tone that had prevailed, uh, particularly in the 80s and 90s, where we talked about that idea of the me decade, this idea of the, the culture of narcissism that we were looking at um, in the writings of figures like John Updike. Well, after 9-11, particularly in the sort of first five years after 9-11, there was this much more somber, much more geopolitical, geopolitically serious, much more patriotic, much more martial as a militaristic tone that American culture takes on. And a number of thinkers say, say that the age of irony has come to an end. And what they had in mind was that postmodern irony, where everything seems like a joke everything seems sort of funny and by the by the 90s that had gone from very highbrow writers like Thomas Pynchon that had filtered down into popular culture and had become a common everyday attitude in you know TV shows of the period of like the like the Simpsons or Seinfeld or Beavis and Butthead this sort of ambient nihilistic irony in which everything was treated as a kind of flippant joke and uh, with the attacks of 9-11, this postmodern irony that by then had been generalized throughout the culture was said to have come to an end. And I think these two ideas, the end of history and the end of irony, really structure the writings of the, of the new sincerity, particularly those of David Foster Wallace, who was inveighing against irony a decade before 9-11. I think a lot of writers, particularly, again, we're looking at a generational shift. So Generation X writers, writers born in the 60s and 70s, were growing up in an atmosphere where the writers they were given to read in school uh, were the ones of the previous generations like Thomas Pynchon and, uh, and Grace Paley. And while they saw certain virtues in their work, I think they also, uh, just generally, as you, as you have a generational shift, they want to rebel. 
Um, and they are, and the, the way in which they rebel is wanting to overthrow this idea of postmodern irony. And I think the end of history is a context for them because it's the political background in which they're coming of age because they want to say that let's move literature away from the strongly ideological interests of postmodern or even multiculturalist writing and move it towards interests in just sort of base level human to human connections, a kind of moral concern about how you treat the person in front of you rather than what you see in a Pinchon, in a DeLillo, uh, in a Toni Morrison, which is this concern for the systems and structures in which we interact with people. They, you know, the new sincere writers are going to say, this is too abstract, it's kind of dehumanizing, it's kind of inhuman, let's get back to sort of one-to-one -one human connections. And so that, um, that end of history idea that ideological conflict and ideology in general is passe that's in the past that's in the dustbin of history as somebody or other one said um ideology is not important all that's important in the political sphere is spreading human rights and what does that look like in art what looks like spreading empathy and spreading uh human connection and we've seen those ideas of empathy and human connection throughout the course that's an idea that's always uh, existed in uh, particularly in the realist tradition of fiction and we're going to see it again uh, this week but I think it becomes much more of a proclaimed ethical priority it becomes almost ironically an ideology of its own I think in this idea of the new sincerity that we're going to see this week and a little bit next week too in a writer like Jennifer Egan so what is the new sincerity since I'm throwing this phrase around so this was a phrase that was applied to mm -hmm. a moment in uh, the literature and the art, the literature and art, and even the socio-political thought of the late twentieth and tw early twenty-first century, where there's a new generation of figures. They want to venture beyond postmodernism. They want to go beyond postmodernism's idea that all of our experiences are mediated through culture and mediated through media and mediated through technology, and that truth is inaccessible authenticity is inaccessible, morality is inaccessible, uh, all of that is sort of veiled by language, by signs, by culture, that we're in this realm of simulacra we can't get out of. And a lot of the postmodern writers who wrote about that were lamenting it and were critiquing it, and I think we see that in, uh, in Don DeLillo, for instance, and even in John Ashbery, but nonetheless I think they thought it was true. The writers of The New Sincerity, I think, thought that writing about it in the way that somebody like DeLillo or Ashbery wrote about it in a style that emphasized the inaccessibility of truth or feeling ended up being complicit with it. So even if they wanted to lament it, they were still sort of extending it by their style of writing, which tended to de-emphasize human emotion and human connection and human morality. So the idea of the new sincerity is sort of just as it sounds, uh, is to favor in art the earnest expression of emotion. And I, and I would also add the earnest advocacy of morality as a reaction against this postmodern irony, which says we can't feel anything, we can't help anything, we can't know anything, in this consumer culture of signs. So if you go to the bottom of the slide, I have a screenshot of the initial Wikipedia entry for the new sincerity from 2006, and I think they sum it up well. Privileging human connection and non-ironic expressions of sentiment and concern instead of disconnection and lofty cynicism, the new sincerity increasingly returns academic attention from the increasingly so remember to proofread, don't repeat a word like that, deadening emphasis on social construction and the deconstruction of the soul in cultural studies to previously suspect topics such as beauty and aspects of the emotional life. So let's de-emphasize all that Thomas Pynchon, Don DeLillo, Philip K. Dick, Grace Paley, Ursula K. Le Guin stuff about how we can't know anything outside these language games and how, you know, we have to, to be afraid of narratives that, uh, that are 
you know, um, totalizing. Let's just sort of bracket all that off, put that off to the side and focus on how things feel between us as human beings. And David Foster Wallace, who we're about to discuss, uh, we're going to look at a selection of one of his essays, is I think the figurehead really of this movement. He's the person that most comes to my mind when I think about the new sincerity. And there's a quote from him that is often cited as a quote summarizing the values of the new sincerity. You can find it on the current Wikipedia entry for the new sincerity. And this is from an essay he wrote called E Unibus Plurum Television and U.S. Fiction, because he was very concerned with the effects of media on, on our culture. But I think, again, it's not that he disagreed with the postmodernists about what was happening, the way that we were increasingly enclosed within media and sign systems. It's that he thought it was the duty of the fiction writer to sort of break us out of that. Um, instead of just writing about it in ways that somehow indulged it or made it seem inevitable or natural or irresistible. <clears throat> so he says in this essay, the next real literary rebels in this country might well emerge as some weird bunch of anti-rebels, born oglers, that is people who stare, who look, who dare somehow to back away from ironic watching, who have the childish gall actually to endorse and instantiate single entendre principles. So single entendre means something that means only one thing. Remember the postmodern ideal of the proliferation of meanings. We saw that probably most clearly in um, Ursula Le Guin Schrodinger's Cat, where the world was just so radically uncertain that anything could be anything else. He says, no, let's endorse single entendre principles, principles that only mean one thing, who treat of plain old untrendy human troubles and emotions in U.S. life with reverence and conviction, who eschew self-consciousness and hip fatigue. The new rebels might be artists willing to risk the yawn, the rolled eyes, the cool smile, the nudged ribs, the parody of gifted ironists, the oh how banal, to risk accusations of sentimentality, melodrama, of overcredulity, of softness. So I want to emphasize a couple things there. So one of the things is he points out that um, to do this, you will have to be not so much a rebel as an anti-rebel, and you will risk being not hip. You will risk being uncool. And I think that that reflects the extent to which postmodern principles came to dominate popular culture and the culture in some ways of the political left in America in the late uh, 20th century, in the 80s and 90s, that you can't call yourself a rebel if you rebel against it because the sort of natural rebels, the political left, have already uh, announced this stance. And so you might be considered a conservative if you adopt this new sincerity. And, and in fact, David Foster Wallace had politically conservative uh, leanings, especially early in his life. Um, so there might be a certain conservatism to this. And it had become the style of popular culture. I mentioned some of the TV shows of the era that reveled in postmodern irony. Uh, we could also look at MTV, the channel that used to show uh, music videos. Even when I was a kid, they were had moved away from that. But um, the the format of the music video and the way in which they were presented on MTV tended to reinforce a sense of postmodern irony because they were known for sort of you know music videos when they first came out were almost controversial because of their form because they had this quick cut quality to them they would you know the the camera would cut to like every few seconds and so the world was just radically fragmented into these little bits and pieces that you couldn't reassemble um i mean you know maybe you could but uh it sort of worked against it the form worked against forming any sense of the coherent so the postmodernism had really become mainstream by the late 20th century. It had gone from an artistic avant-garde style of the 1960s to becoming a mainstream cultural style in the 1990s. And Wallace and other writers like George Saunders or Jennifer Egan, I think uh, Gen X writers, writers of a younger generation at the time, want to revolt against this. They want to have a new literary vanguard 
avant-garde movement that ironically won't look avant-garde at all. It will look sort of conservative. It will look back to more traditional moral values. And again, I connect that to the end of history because it's saying, um, let's dispense with all this concern with the ideological, with the intellectual, with the abstract, these concerns that dominated the Cold War, and let's get to um, these one-to-one -one human connections, just as politics is about dismissing ideology and trying to just advance human rights in the period. There is one point of continuity between postmodernism and the new sincerity, which is a fear, I think, in both cases of the grand narrative. I think postmodernism and new sincerity both dismiss grand totalizing narratives like Marxism or like fascism. I think they're in agreement there. But I think for new sincerity, postmodernism, in dismissing the grand narrative, dismissed everything else. They sort of threw out the baby with the bathwater. You can't have morality. You can't have beauty and art. You can't have knowledge. Everything everything sort of fell away with the grand narrative. So they're saying, let's try to reconstruct morality and meaning even in the absence of these grand narratives, which we agree had to disappear. In both cases, though, you have an end of uh, big universal totalizing ideologies. So who is David Foster Wallace, the, this leading figure of the new sincerity that makes these claims in the early 90s? So David Foster Wallace lived from 1962 to 2008. He uh, was raised in Urbana, Illinois. I think he was born in, uh, in New York. But he was raised in Urbana, Illinois by parents who were academics. So his, uh, his father, I think, was a philosophy professor and his mother was an English professor. And they placed great emphasis on intelligence and on learning. And he often wrote about this um, on his, you know, his parents' emphasis on learning and intelligence. And he was a tennis prodigy. Uh, so he was, well, I don't know, he's a tennis prodigy. What's a prodigy in tennis? I don't know anything about tennis. Anyway, the point is, my point is this. His parents placed a lot of emphasis on academic achievement and on other kinds of achievement. And he was a very high achieving person throughout his childhood um, in ways I think that probably, judging from some of his writing, led to some of the problems he faced in his life. Um, because also throughout his life, he struggled with substance uh, abuse and addiction and with mental health and so and I think if you read some of his writings or sort of make inferences from some of his fiction I think you can see that some of that could possibly be traced back to uh, some of uh, the, the the pressure he felt he was under in his childhood um, so he majors in English and philosophy at Amherst College and then he gets his MFA his Master of Fine Arts degree in fiction at the University of Tucson so we're still um, in fact, we're at an even more intense moment of this professionalization and academicization of, uh, of fiction writing. Most writers of Wallace's generation who make it big get an MFA. And then he later taught English at several colleges throughout his life. He, uh, in keeping with his general air of precocity, uh, of, uh, of sort of uh, pre premature development. He's often referred to as, I've seen him referred to as the boy genius, even as, a, you know, as, as he was in middle age. He was called the boy genius. So he publishes his first novel at the age of 25. And then not too long after that, uh, I think when he's just about 30, he publishes his enormous novel, Infinite Jest, in 1996. Infinite Jest is a very long novel. I think it's over a thousand pages. Um, he had like 200 of which are end notes. He couldn't write anything without end notes or footnotes, fiction or nonfiction. It is a novel, it's a kind of dystopian science fiction novel about a future America ruled by corporations. And it's got two sort of settings uh, and two protagonists, one of whom is a very David Foster Wallace-like figure who is a tennis prodigy at a tennis academy whose father is a filmmaker who made a video so addictive that if you watch it, you will do nothing else but watch it and then you'll die. And then there's this other character who is, um, uh, who's an alcoholic who spends a lot of time in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and the video, and then the novel becomes sort of a quest for this video, uh, which, you know, the characters, and there's like a 
Quebecois terrorist group. Listen, I have to confess something to you. This I have not finished Infinite Jest. I'm still on page 500. I've been on page 500 for seven years. Um, and there, <laughs> there's a lot in it that is extraordinary. Uh, Wallace was immensely gifted as a writer. There's also a lot in it that I found completely tiresome um, and very ill-advised and... Uh, is like the Quebecois terrorists uh, and some of the satirical elements that weren't very funny. Um, and it just felt to me like there were, it, this were, this was two, this was three novels put together, two of them quite good, one of them not so good. And I, I might've preferred to read them separately, but look, a lot of people like Infinite Jest. As I said, there's extraordinary stuff happening in it. Uh, I, I recommend at least trying it out. I do plan and hope to finish it someday. I just haven't. I haven't done so yet. Um, but it's an interesting book, and it was a huge success in 1996. Um, and it's been kind of a popular classic uh, ever since then. He's also renowned, though, for his nonfiction. Uh, I think Wallace is almost equally renowned for his nonfiction as for his fiction, which included journalism and essays of sort of cultural commentary. And in his nonfiction, he, I think, was an inheritor of the new journalists. If you remember when he talked about Joan Didion, though David Foster Wallace and Joan Didion have uh, the most polar opposite styles, I can imagine, because she's a severe minimalist and he's an extreme maximalist. Nevertheless, I think they're both working in this same with this same attitude that journalism, just because you're writing journalism, doesn't mean that you have to sacrifice your style or your personality as a writer. So he wrote journalism that had a lot of the features of his fiction, sort of long, painfully self-conscious sentences that sort of coiling and looping back on themselves, um, an interesting combination of very elevated language or technical language with slang, uh, a use of footnotes and endnotes, which is probably Wallace's biggest signature, I think, as a writer, is this use of the footnote. He was a very self-conscious writer. And there's a kind of, the, the thing about Wallace that's ironic is uh, it's the old principle that you most criticize in others what you most dislike in yourself. And so it's clear that what troubled Wallace about postmodernism was that it reinforced what were already his damaging mental habits, which was a self-consciousness so painful that he couldn't bear it, uh, a feeling of extreme sort of discomfort in himself. And he thought that this fiction and this I, this attitude of irony about everything just made our whole culture into this painfully self-conscious spectacle. And then alongside that, you medicate this with the easy pleasures of the things we're addicted to, which that could be illegal substances, but it could also be television or other kinds of pacifying media. So Wallace was criticizing what was damaging his own life and so much part of his own sensibility and his own soul. And so his writing is often ironic because it feels postmodern. It's very self-conscious. It's very tricky. It calls your attention to the surface of the text. When you're constantly, when you're reading Infinite Jest and there's three end notes on every page that make you flip to the back of the book, you can't help but be conscious that you're reading a book. It, it can't help but be a metafictional gesture. So he uses all these gestures, but he wants to undo them from within to make you almost disgusted with them and to get you to the other side of a single entendre principle and a kind of uncomplicated moral stance. And I think the piece we're reading today is a very clear example of that, an excerpt from his famous essay, Consider the Lobster. So just to finish out his biography, he struggled with mental health throughout his life. Um, he was often in recovery for addiction. He uh, was um, on medications for depression uh, from, I think, from his college years onward, and his struggles with the medication and the side effects and his inability to keep taking it was, I think, the precipitating event for his suicide in 2008, which was a very shocking event in the literary world. And as for Wallace's posthumous uh, uh, reputation, it's kind of, 
twofold or bifurcated. He probably is the most influential American writer of his generation, the sort of iconic Generation X writer. And a lot of his uh, principles and a lot of his style uh, made a mark on writers of his generation and afterwards. On the other hand, um, with the publication of a biography, uh, I think about a decade ago, and some of the revelations of some of his particularly former lovers, the extent to which he was a somewhat abusive figure in private life, I, I think that didn't, I think, I actually think his life in a lot of ways parallels Raymond Carver's in that he had some early relationships when a lot of his mental health and addiction issues were not at all under control and he was, um, and that sort of fed into uh, some really damaging and irrational uh, and harmful behavior. And then I think by the time he's, he gets married to an artist named Karen Green, I think those days were behind him, but um, the, the testimony of what he had done uh, in his earlier life definitely sort of mars his posthumous representation. And the other, the other thing about that is immediately after his death that he was almost sort of canonized as this saint-like figure, particularly because of a graduation speech, a commencement address. And they, my image on my slide might even be him giving this commencement address. I'm not even sure. No, I guess he'd be wearing a cap and gown. He always wore a bandana, by the way. That was his signature. Uh, he, he was always photographed in a bandana, would go on TV in a bandana. Uh, he said he was just sweaty, that there was not, no meaning behind it. But, uh, but that's his signature look. But um, what was I saying? Oh, his commencement address, which was published as a sort of stocking stuffer like gift book called This Is Water, in which he it's very new sincere. He's enjoining the audience, the graduates to treat other people well. And I think that this idea that there was something saintly about him uh, almost set him up for the, for a, to be knocked off that pedestal when the biography was published. And so you had an, a, an, an almost immediate swing in the other direction. Oh, well, this guy was a, was a bastard and he wasn't, uh, he wasn't a saint at all. And we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't revere him in any, in any way. Um, and so it, it became this kind of wild swing between two poles of this figure in a halo versus this devil. Um, and, you know, and I think that, uh, well, I don't know. I, I don't know what you what you make of a person's life. I, I, I don't I'm not qualified to make ethical judgments about a whole life. What I am you know, going to say is that it's a very influential body of writing. And so I think it's a body of writing that can't at this point be ignored, even though I say hypocritically, since I haven't finished Infinite Jest. I, I, I did not ignore Infinite Jest to the extent that I read the first 500 pages. Uh, and I will finish it. I will. It's, it's, I'm looking at it. It's across the room. I still have it. Um, anyway, my quote from the Norton bio says that his, uh, I, I just was wanted to fix on this idea of his style that was by turns sincere and satirical, self-conscious and arrogant, intellectual and lowbrow. And like Pinchon before him, uh, I think he is interested in using every type of language, every register of the English language together in one piece of writing. He doesn't write in a single style. He wants to combine all styles. Uh, and in and this, I think he's a very American writer in a way, ways that go back to Herman Melville and Walt Whitman, this desire to capture all of America in language and all of America's languages in, in a piece of writing. So that's my introduction to David Foster Wallace. I want to look at a few excerpts from his essay, Consider the Lobster that I asked you to read. And so this is an interesting essay. It is, um, we only got a piece of it. There's a journalistic aspect to it where he did travel to a lobster festival in Maine. And the piece that you were given in the Norton Anthology focuses on his sort of, um, not so much his reporting from the festival, but his, uh, the questions it inspires in him, the meditations it inspires in him, and the questions he asks the reader. And I think it's a very good example of the new sincerity, because what he's trying to say, ultimately, the thesis of the essay, is that lobsters are sufficiently sentient creatures that um, what is done to them to prepare them to be food, 
is a kind of torture. And once you come to terms with that, can you still eat a lobster um, as an individual? And it is very individual. Uh, he's addressing the reader person to person. It's not so much in the passage we're given anyway, like a structural analysis of the structure of what allows this to take place. The way you get, if you think of an earlier essay we read, like Gloria Ansel, Gloria Ansel Duas, La Conciencia de la Mestiza, where she talks about the sort of structural relations among the races in the, in the American continents and the history that sort of brought uh, brought those relations to the point they were when she was writing. He takes a very different approach. He wants to look at this as a moral question, not a systemic one. What will you do as an individual? Don't think systemically. Don't think ideologically. We're at the end of history. The question is, is your practice right now a moral one? And so he says, still, after all the abstract intellection, there remains the facts of the frantically clanking lid, the pathetic clinging to the edge of the pot. Standing at the stove, it is hard to deny in any meaningful way that this is a living creature experiencing pain and wishing to avoid escape the painful experience. To my lay mind, the lobster's behavior in the kettle appears to be the expression of a preference, and it may well be that an ability to form preferences is the decisive criterion for real suffering. So forget the abstract intellection. Look at what's in front of you. This creature is in pain and is visibly signaling to you its pain. And that raises a moral question. However, Wallace uses a footnote. He uses footnotes throughout this essay and throughout all of his writing. And that's why I'm calling this slide meta morality, because Wallace was also hyper self conscious in ways that made him always reflect on the language he was using and the ideas he was putting out. However, I think he uses this meta quality, this quality that calls attention to the text as a text by, you know, questioning the words he's using in a footnote. I think he uses this to a very different end than the postmodernists used it. So let's read the footnote. So he puts a footnote at the end of the sentence um, uh, that begins to my lay mind and ends with suffering. And his footnote is about the word he uses, preference. Preference is maybe roughly synonymous with interests, but it is a better term for our purposes because it is less abstractly philosophical. Preference seems more personal, and it's the whole idea of a living creature's personal experience that's at issue. So he is self-conscious about the fact that he's trying to get to the best language he can use to arrive at the truth he wants to tell. He's not calling attention to the language he's using in order to say, in the way that a, you know, a John Ashbery might say, uh, all language is sort of artificial and we can't get to the truth behind it. Wallace is saying, I am hyper-conscious about the language I use because I want to use the language that best approximates what I want to say. And in this case, that best approximates something that is moral, that is personal, that is not abstract. So Wallace is not meta-textual meta so much as he's meta-moral. The constant inquiry into moral questions to make sure that you're behaving in the most moral way possible. There's also, I think, a concern in this essay uh, with what I'm calling the right side of history. So we talked about the end of history. Now, if history has ended with the decisive victory of one ideological, political, ethical system, liberal democracy, then it becomes possible for us to look back at all prior cultures and ideologies and forms of government and systems of ethics and judge how they meet the standard of the now triumphant liberal democracy. 
And that's why this idea of the right side of history becomes so prominent. This was a phrase, for instance, that Barack mm. Obama always used throughout his presidency, that we want to be on the right side of history. Well, you can only know what the right side was if you know what all of history was moving rightly toward. So the right side of history and the end of history are related concepts. They imply one another. Only when history has ended and all the conflicts that made it up have been settled in favor of what Fukuyama called the final form of government, can you then judge all prior forms of government and social organization to have been more or less close to liberal democracy. And if they were more close, they were on the right side of history. And if they were less close, they were on the wrong side of history. And I think Wallace uses a right side of history argument when he's talking about whether or not you should eat the lobster uh, as you consider mm. the suffering that it might be in. So he says, the truth is that if you, the festival attendee, so he sort of positions you as attending the main lobster festival, the MLF, the truth is that if you, the festival attendee, permit yourself to think that lobsters can suffer and would rather not, the MLF begins to take on the aspect of something like a Roman circus or medieval torture fest. Does that comparison seem a bit much? If so, exactly why? Or what about this one? Is it possible that future generations will regard our present agribusiness and eating practices in much the same way we now view Nero's entertainments or Mengele's experiments? Nero being a famously cruel Roman emperor and Mengele being a Nazi scientist that did unconsensual experiments on people in Nazi concentration camps. So we've judged them to be on the wrong side of history. And if the further extension of rights and freedoms consistent with liberal democracy begins to apply to the animal world over the next, you know, decades or centuries as we further refine and expand these democratic ideals, will our time be found to be on the wrong side of history for not having realized that soon enough? So the end of history... Um, sort of turns all of history into a moral court uh, in which you can ask if various societies were on the right or the wrong side. And so the moral questions that Wallace is trying to get us to ask and trying to force upon us, force our attention to, become very weighty and become matters for historical inquiry. So, sorry, I just wanted to make sure that was the end. <laughs> right, so that is David Foster Wallace's Consider the Lobster. That is his very sincere and even newly sincere attempt to get us to think through moral questions, make the right moral choices, and be on the right side of history. So that's David Foster Wallace, and that's the end of this lecture. Thanks very much, and have a good day.